Okay, and I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see that okay? Okay. Um, here is my, as can you see the continued study of Paul there? It's weird, why isn't the Zoom showing up? It's not sharing. This one? Now, can you guys see it? Okay. All right, all right. So um, just continuing the, my study on Paul, last time we covered the end of Acts chapter 20 and part of chapter 21, and we discussed Paul's final meeting with the ministry in Ephesus and his warning about uh, wolves both entering and attacking from within the church. We also talked about how Paul was warned repeatedly about going to Jerusalem. Um, several told him not to go, that he would be in danger when he got there, but he continued to Jerusalem anyway. We left off where Paul met with the other apostles in Jerusalem. They requested that he go with uh, four men to the temple to complete their time of purification, make their offerings of thanksgiving and dedication to their vow of purification, and Paul agreed to go. So he's going into the temple at this point, and that's where we left off last time when I was teaching on Paul. So um, we're going to continue in chapter 21 of Acts. Would someone like to read verses 27 through 30 for me? Sure. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, <clears throat> Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law this, and this place. And further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. For they had seen before with him in the city Trophimus and sure. Ophelia, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together. And they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. Thank you, sister. Okay, I'm going to try, and um, I think I have on my desktop a... Um, a temple diagram here that'll kind of maybe help us um, understand a little bit better this concept. Um, and then I'm going to share, go back to Zoom and share it. Okay, so... Um, Paul arrives in Jerusalem as the seven days of Pentecost are coming to an end. That was a high holy feast time. So that meant that there were lots of people throughout um, all of the known world traveling to Jerusalem at this time. And so the men of Asia, which were modern day Turkey today, they came and um, took took Paul and, you know, grabbed him saying that he's the man stirring up all this trouble, teaching people to go against the law. And I don't think that Paul was going against the law per se, but he did know that following the law didn't bring salvation, right? Christ brings salvation and only following him could provide that, which I guess is different from the law in that sense, right? Um, they were also accusing him of bringing a Gentile in the, into the temple, which was strictly forbidden. Um, I read in a commentary that um, if a Gentile was seen outside of the court of the Gentile, so if you can kind of see this diagram, this is from my Bible, um, there's um, the court of the Gentiles, which is on the outside of the temple itself, right? 
And then there's this court of the women or treasury on this part. And then there's these steps going up it. And then past the altar is the porch. And then past the porch is the holy place and then the most holy place. So this is kind of how the temple was set up. There were um, places for women to, to worship the Lord. And then this altar, they would bring like their sacrifices, right? All the animals for sacrifice up to the altar. And the priests would you know, perform the sacrifice. And then only the priests were allowed up these steps into the porch, the holy place, and the most holy place. So the Gentiles were only allowed in this outer court area here. And I, I read that if, if anyone brought someone, um, a Gentile, um, past the court of the gentiles um they could be killed on the spot this is, yeah this is this is church yeah this is church. law like it was a, it was a thing where um if if they were you know if it, there was actually i guess there was like some kind of a a sign posted um <laughs> you know, in, in, by the sacred entrances that if a um if a uh, like the Romans understood this. This was like the, like the temple was like the Jewish land. <laughs> like they understood this. Um, that if you know, they, they actually gave the right the right to the Jews to kill them without questioning them, even if they were Roman citizens. So there was a sign posted. You know, if you go beyond this point and you're a Gentile, you you know, it could mean certain death. Really interesting. Any thoughts on that? So this was a serious situation, like like you know, Paul being accused of bringing these Gentiles into the the temple area. They, I don't think they were actually Gentiles, but being accused of being bringing Gentiles in, they could kill the Gentiles and kill Paul. And that's what they were setting out to do here. Okay, we'll continue. Anyone want to read 31 through 34? Where is it? And when I'm telling you, I think of the people in it, that all the people in the world are. For the other people so included to throw in the land out of the country, and they saw the chief captain and the soldier, they left being Paul. Then the chief captain came near and took me to the end of the day to bound with the chief captain. And he was, you know, he had done the sun by some fire on the day on the other and what he had done. No, it's small. It's going to be very easy. Okay. All right. So they weren't just trying to get, like I mentioned before, they weren't just trying to get Paul um, out of the temple, right? The mob's goal was to keep his only self. They were not happy with him. Um, uh, which is a Roman, the Antone Fortress, um, located close to the temple. And when the captain from the fort arrives, he stops them from beating Paul to death, breaks up the mob, and asks what Paul had done. And they can't agree. The mob is shouting one thing. They're shouting another, but the mob can't come to a consensus on what Paul was actually guilty of. So um, um, the same place where Christ was. You guys back? Did we lose you? No, we're still here. We're here. Okay. We'll see you. Okay, I was just the computer's acting all weird. Sorry. 
Um, okay, so going back to my screen share. So I, not to put on this rabbit hole um, too far, but um, there are disputations among Jewish historians on how the temple was set up and what they consider to be like the Temple Mount versus where the actual temple may have been located. Um, there are some that believe, you know, this um, here um, in relation to the temple grounds here. And then like here would be where the Gentile um, area would be around the temple. Um, and then other archeologists who've studied Josephus, I'm not sure how many people know who Josephus was, but he was a ancient historian, uh, Jewish historian who wrote about things, you know, in relation to the time of Christ. And um, he, he describes the temple area to look like this. So like this would, this would be like what the modern day temple mount is considered where the Dome of the Rock is located, this area here, and then the temple would have been located here. Okay, so um, Josephus says that this is where this um, Paul addresses the mob in Acts 21 in relation to the temple. And this fits better with actual other Roman fortresses. Roman fortresses were never this small. Roman fortresses were this were this size here. If you look, you know, in archaeologists um, who've done research of Roman fortresses of, from that time period, that's what that, that's the size of the Roman fortresses um, from this time period. So not to go down this huge rabbit hole, but um this could be its own lesson or several lessons but it's possible that what's commonly known as the temple mount isn't actually the temple it was actually the antonia fortress and the temple would some research i've done in the past and where the actual temple site was probably located in relation to the to the fort um yeah uh-huh yeah. Uh huh. Well, <laughs> well, this is the thing. I mean, Paul was warned not to go, right? I mean, he was warned multiple times by known prophets not to go to Jerusalem. For this very reason, because they knew trouble would befall him there. Now, it, I don't know. I, this is the thing. It's like it doesn't really say that Paul brought Gentiles into the temple. It sounds like these individuals were Jewish men who were following the Nazarite law, the Nazarite vow, and they were finishing their time. <laughs> so it sounds like these individuals were Jewish, but the people thought they were Gentiles. Well, that's a good point. In in the Old Testament, when Solomon prays for his prayer over the temple, he actually talks about that all nations would come to this place to meet the Lord. And that was the point. That was the point of the temple. It wasn't just for the Jews. It was also for everyone else. But at the time of Christ, they had this kind of sectioned off. And the scribes and Pharisees were counting Gentiles as heathen, evil people. But I don't think that's what Solomon or God intended. Um, any thoughts on that? Uh, I just have a thought. Um, it was necessary, I think, you go like 17, 18, 19, as you lead up to where we're at in the lesson. Uh, he was commissioned, he had to go to Jerusalem for what was being preached there. So even though the prophets, they told him not to go because they know the trouble's going to break. 
but he had to bring the truth that the Jews should have a reason to say, well, we didn't know. We didn't understand. So therefore, he had to go. And he wasn't worried about with that because if you think of maybe in the 18th chapter where you're in the 19th chapter, he said, well, go, fear not them. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to take care of you. So Paul knew yeah. that God was going to take care of him going into Jerusalem to deliver that message. And the Lord's will be done, right? That's yep. what he says. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Very good. Good comment. Yeah. I mean, Peter was there too. Peter knew uh, the Gentiles were, uh, you know, God, God told Peter too, right? That, you know, he wasn't, he, wasn't, he wasn't as bold as Paul was though, you see. <laughs> he had to be persuaded. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Peter, yeah, Peter, Peter knew too. He, he, God told Peter, don't call him queen what I call queen, right? So, yep. so yeah, I mean, Peter knew too, but Paul was a lot more bold. You're right. Good points. Okay, so um, going back to the scripture here. Would someone like to read uh, 37 through 39? Paul was to be led into the castle and he said unto the chief captain, may I speak unto thee, who said, canst thou speak free? Art thou not that Egyptian which before the days of the Davis to the uproar and led us out into the wilderness four thousand men who were murdered? But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew, a person city in Sicilia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. Thank you. Okay, so this is this honestly, the way it's written is kind of confusing, and so I had to do some research on this. Um Paul asks the soldier if he could speak with him, apparently speaking in Greek. And the soldier is immediately surprised. Um, he must have thought he was some sort of terrorist or troublemaker. Now, Sim, if Paul was the Egyptian man who had recently, apparently, this is based on um, history, okay? I guess Josephus actually mentions this in his writings. Um, there was some kind of an Egyptian man who'd recently led a group of 4,000 men to the Mount of Olives and declared that they were going to take over the Temple Mount. And um, Josephus writes about this event in historical records. In that incident, the Roman soldiers were able to break up the crowd, but somehow the leader escaped. So he got away, this guy, this Egyptian guy. And so the Roman soldier who seized him must have thought that Paul was that Egyptian guy that had recently, you know, previously gotten away and escaped custody, and now they've captured him. But Paul says, "No, I'm a Jew from Tar Tarsus." Um, when it says "mean second city," and I read that Tarsus, where Paul was was from, where he where he was born was known throughout the ancient world as a cultural and educational center, much like Athens and Alexandria. Um, it was located in Sicilia, which is, you know, we've read before, a province of Rome, and many of its people were well-educated, so I'm sure the guards were immediately impressed by Paul. Um, he was no ordinary criminal. <clears throat> Paul asked the guards if he can speak to the people. They must have been so impressed by him that they let him speak. So Paul turns to the crowd and begins preaching in Hebrew. So he speaks to the guards in Greek and then starts preaching to the people in Hebrew, beginning in um, chapter 22. Any thoughts on this before we continue? No? Okay. Go back to my screen share. And this is kind of a lot. I wanted to actually read all of Paul's sermon here. Um, so we'll, we'll break it up into, into sections. Would someone like to read the beginning here? And brethren and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake and the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he said, I am bitterly a man, which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Sosia, uh, so Sosia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect man of the law of the fathers, 
and was zealous for God and are his name. And I persecuted uh, this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prison for men and men. And also the high priest doth bear me with also. I received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. Okay. Would someone like to continue reading here? I can. Acts uh, 21 continued. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, Suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me, and I fell onto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise, and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. Okay, a little bit more. I can read this part. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. In the same hour I looked up upon him, and he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. And he continues here. It says, and it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him saying unto me, make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of, of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. So um, Paul, um, important, I, I guess, just to you know give this understanding he gives a, a complete testimony of his conversion that we previously read in acts chapter 9 he begins his sermon by saying hear my defense and this word defense is translated from the greek word apologia i don't know if anyone's ever heard of the word apologetics before but that's where that word comes from and it doesn't mean apology in the sense of i'm sorry and i repent for what i did it means um, giving a, a, a defense uh, or justification for following a certain type of doctrine. And that's what he's saying here. He's giving his defense for why he is serving the Lord like he is. He clarifies that although he was born outside of Judea, he was raised in Jerusalem and taught by Gamaliel, one of the most well-respected rabbis of their time. He says he was jealous toward the law, knew it well, and persecuted and imprisoned those that followed Jesus, even unto death, just as these people were about to do to him. He explains that he was on assignment when he went to Damascus. He received commandment from the high priest to arrest followers of Christ there with instructions to bring them back to Jerusalem for punishment. While on this mission, he explains that Jesus appeared to him. And even though those that were traveling with him saw the light that shone about them they couldn't hear jesus and what he said he says that he was blind after this experience because of the glory of the light that he saw so he had to be led to damascus and he makes it a point to mention that he met ananias there a man who was well known for following the law 
Um, he explains what Ananias told him, that the Lord had chosen Paul to be, he's seen and heard. Ananias knew that Paul had seen for himself the just one, meaning Christ, and that he needed to follow through with the steps for salvation, be baptized to wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Any thoughts on that before we continue? Just a, just, just, just a couple. Um, I, I like the way um, Paul was thinking since he was commissioned to go out and do these things, everybody knew, it, which was true. It was true, right? But what he was missing was that the message wasn't going to the house of Israel through him. It was going to the Gentiles through him. So he thought that if he went as Paul, what he'd done, they would receive the message. I said, no, they're not going to receive this. You're going to have to go this way. And that's what Paul was fighting against. Very good. Yeah, it's interesting. And we'll talk about that, brother, at the end of his, um, his sermon um, uh, that Christ told him, I'll send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And that's what stirs up the crowd again, because they hear this word Gentiles and they're like, oh, no, <laughs> absolutely not. We are not putting up with this guy anymore. He explains to the crowd after he spent time in Damascus um, that he traveled to Jerusalem, went to the temple. And while he was there, he had a vision and conversation with the Lord. The Lord told him to leave Jerusalem immediately because the people there wouldn't hear his testimony and he'd be hard. Lord, at that time, how he imprisoned and beat his followers, consenting even to Stephen's ex execution. Then he says that the Lord once again told him to leave, that he was sending him to preach to the Gentiles. And I found it interesting that at least um, some of this information, this, con this um, conversation that he had with the Lord in the temple, I don't think that was listed in Acts chapter 9. And I don't think it's listed anywhere else in any of Paul's writings. Does anybody know if he references that, that conversation that he has with the Lord in the temple? I couldn't find it, but I, maybe I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, thought, I just thought that was interesting. And yeah, at the end of, at the end of that, um, that, that sermon, when he mentions Gentiles, that's what causes the crowd to go nuts again. Um, so I, I just, I, I, I didn't want to go too much further because I know we were probably going to be coming up on time with this lesson, but we can go into their, um, their reaction of what happens after Paul mentions the word Gentiles uh, next time. Any other thoughts? expand out further to those who were not concerning themselves with God in the first place, which they were also opposed, right? So you've got conflict outside and inside uh, in terms of the faith. <laughs> it can be a, a tumultuous and, and lonely place sometimes because there's just so much turmoil over understanding God and what a telling statement for Paul to say, who are you, Lord? That question is so interesting. He's, he knows he's Lord, but yet he doesn't understand who the Lord is. His identity is what he stands for. And yet he's devoted his whole life to the Lord. What a strange question for Paul to ask. And you know, I think that's true for many, that they think they're serving the Lord, but they could also ask, well, who are you? They really don't understand. Uh, people don't understand Christ. They don't understand the fullness and the restoration of the gospel. Uh, there's just a lot of misperception. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, it, it, I did a study. I, I don't 
remember if I did this with this group or not. I may have when we first moved here, but a study on the difference between sin, iniquity, and transgression. And sin means specifically to miss the mark. That's essentially what sin is. It's missing the mark. There's a consider our lives are are um, like trying to serve the Lord as a as a bullseye, right? There's a bullseye, and then there's the you know you go out and out further from the bullseye. Sin is essentially missing the bullseye, missing the mark. And um, so often in scripture, from the very, very beginning with Adam and Eve, even I've been, like I said, I've been studying in Genesis lately, reading in Genesis and listening to podcasts on it. But um, this concept of sin, right? Missing the mark is from the very beginning. It's right. It's, it's from the very first, um, you know, story of Cain and Abel. And I would even argue Adam and Eve with their choice to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this concept of, um, you know, God saying, just don't do it. And Eve seeing the fruit that it was good, right? The fruit was good to her eyes and she did what was right in her own eyes. And she partook of the fruit, even though God said, don't do it. And, um, and that's, I think the, the challenge with sin is that we, we, we want to, I think most people, at least those that are serve, that want to serve the Lord want to do what's right by the Lord. But so often we get deceived by what looks good to our own eyes. Right. And, and we think, you know, I think this is fine when it's, when it's not fine. And the Lord, you know, lays out in his word, what's right and what's wrong, what he wants us to do, what he doesn't want us to do. And we do what's seemingly right in our own eyes. And it leads to destruction and turmoil and grief and but we all do. I think that's the thing. It's like, that's what's so deceptive about sin is that most people who, you know, miss the mark, I don't, I don't think they're necessarily doing it to say, I want to miss the mark. It's deceptive in the fact that they think that they're probably doing what's right. I mean, Paul thought he was doing right. He thought he was doing the right thing and he wasn't. Any other thoughts? That, that's my lesson for today. I enjoyed your lesson, uh, uh, putting things down there. It was real good. And even the end with the sin and all those things. Yeah. And you can go a little further than that. I'm looking for you got to add a little more, a little more meat to the bone. You can have some fun with that one. <laughs> I'll wait on it. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. What happens when he says the word Gentiles is just. <laughs> Man, it gets rough. <laughs> all right. I'll give it back to the brothers. God bless you all. You got something?
Now let's see if we can get close to the thing here and see where we're going today. Got a post here. So I keep going this way and this way. Okay. Still working on our logistics here at the uh, at the gym. So uh, let's see if I can move over here a little bit more. There we go. All right. So that's in my mind today. Um, heard a song this week. It goes back to I don't know how many years ago. It's a song by uh, a lady named Jackie Deschan, and uh, it said, "What the world needs now is love, a sweet love." And I can't think of any better opportunity to talk about that at this point in time, love. And what does it mean? And, and where, do you, where do you get the true essence of love in our life? Uh, it does make a difference in our lives when we have love. That we can all attest to it. Because we've had moments where we felt unloved and alone, you know. And then we've had those, those great moments where... You know, love was present in our life and, and our, you know, there was not a thing in the world that could kind of take that joy away that we have. That love is something special. And, and love does come from God. You know, uh, we talked about Paul, talked about his travels. He was uh, visiting Corinthians one time. In the thirteenth chapter of First Corinthians, he talks about it. He gives us a breakdown of it in such a way in terms of what it is. It says, though I speak 
with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, which he refers to as love. He says, uh, I am become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, he says, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, uh, I am nothing, he says. And though I bestow all of my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profited me nothing, it says. Charity suffereth long and kind. Charity envieth not. Charity wanteth not itself, is not puffed up, he says. Doth not behave itself unseemingly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. And whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. You know, charity outlasts everything. You know, it, it just means the world. And uh, it leaves impressions upon him. Found this stuff the other day about what kids think about love. Interesting observations. It says, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time. Even when the hands got arthritis, that's love. A perception from a child. Love is when someone hurts you and you get so mad, but you don't yell at them because you know it would hurt their feelings. That's love from a kid's perspective. Love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure it tastes okay. Love is like a little old woman and a little man who are still friends even after they've known each other so well. Amen. You know? You really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot because people forget. You know, Jesus himself said, we got to be more like kids. The innocence of their observations kind of puts us in our place from time to time, you know? You know, when we think we know it all and we think we've got the world all wrapped up and then we do something stupid, there's some little child that looks at us and wants to know where that love is in your life. You know, it, it's, it's, it's not a word, it's actions. And, and, and that's what, what it is. It's, 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 it's the difference that we make in what we do in life. And, um, you know, in, in, in Greek, or the Greeks have six definitions of, of love or six types of love. You know, there's one called eros, which is a sexual love. And there's one called uh, phila, which is the friendship type of love. And, and then there's uh, something called ludus, which is a playful kind of love. And then there's agape, which is loving everyone. And then there's pragma, which is a long-standing love. And the last one here was uh, what do you call felucia, which is love of yourself. The whole idea of love with those definitions can get kind of confusing, you know. And I think that you know we boil it down that there's two kinds of just like there's two kinds of churches, right? One of the church of God and one of the, the devil. There's two kinds of love. There's natural love. And there's God's kind of love. And those are two different things. And we need to understand that a little bit more in order to kind of give this world that we live in the love that it needs and it's lacking. That we need in our life. Because sometimes without love, it's a lonely place. God's kind of love, supernatural love, love that we really can't explain, that we really can't talk about, you know, it, it's, it's, it's love that, that we can't profess of our own abilities, but it's got to be dependent upon the love of God that flows within us, and that's sometimes unexplainable, we talked about it today, you know, I mean, 
you know, there's just some things that we just cannot do on our own. And I think the true love that is God's kind of love is the love that we have to depend upon him for and, and, and look to him and just be aware of what he's trying to do in our lives by us showing love for other people. Mosiah says, says, for the natural man is an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam and will be forever and ever unless he yields to the enticing of the Holy Spirit. And putteth off the natural man and become a saint to the atonement of Christ the Lord and becometh as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth to inflict upon uh, us, even a, as a child to submit to his father. That whole idea of going back to the childlike qualities of life and seeing innocence in its purest form is what is talked about here that uh, we got to give up this natural life that we've got and the tendencies that we have to be motivated and go in the direction that what we feel in our head is right, you know, and what we need to do is kind of follow after the way like a little child will do, be humble and meek and, 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 and follow after the Holy Spirit of the Lord that we strive to get in our lives every day. That's why we were able to come on Sunday mornings to a place like this and just stop everything that's out there for a minute and kind of reflect upon the week and, 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 and did I take love with me where I went? You know, did I impact people in such a way that the world, what they're looking for is someone to care? I don't know. I can't explain that for you and I can't, can, can, can't define it for you, but the fact of the matter is we all have to be capable of defining it for ourselves. God's kind of love that is put upon our heart. It's a powerful force. You know, and it's compared to nothing on earth. You know, it, it's, uh, it doesn't allow for, you know, uh, uh, revenge. It doesn't allow for getting even, if you will, in, in our lives. And so that's a tendency that seems to be out there in the world today. It's a state that's there for whatever reason. It's just kind of is now going crazy. It's going kind of wild in our lives today. And, you know, we cannot continue that thing. I mean, we cannot change the world. You know, none of us in here are going to change the events of what the world is doing and where it's going. But the fact of the matter is that in our circle of life that we have, for the people that we interact with and, and relate to, we can make a difference to God's kind of love in our life. We just got to seek it. We got to search for it. We got to apply it in our lives from what we learn. God's kind of love. It's powerful. You know, it says here in the, in the fifth verse in what uh, Paul wrote, he says, uh, it doesn't behave itself uh, un unseemingly. It does not seek your own way. It's not easily provoked. And, you know, we shouldn't think evil of things like that. It says that, uh, uh, you know, getting mad at people isn't, isn't love. You know, having control of ourselves is 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 love and that's what we got to show um you know sometimes we don't get treated well sometimes uh you know deeps, and sometimes through no fault of our own we just get up and someone's gonna ask for some reason and what's our first reaction well maybe it's revenge you know sometimes we get hurt you know, and, and, and sometimes it's a bigger. And, and sometimes, you know, uh, our reaction is, well, I am going to get even. I am going to right this ship and I'm going to get my shot at what I've got to do to just get my feelings out there to that individual who hurt me so much. That's not God's kind of love. That's the natural love. That's one of those six definitions that the Greeks put together. In, in the situation, but what we need to seek for is God's kind of love in our life. And we, there's no room for revenge. There's no, there's no place on, in, in our scorebook of life, if you will, to say, okay, you know, uh, he or she's got three things against me, so I'm gonna make it even now. I'm going to keep the score out. No, no, that's not God's kind of love. That's not what he's talking about. And, you know, God's kind of love 
makes a difference in the world today. And it's a difference that probably the world doesn't understand. You know, it's that turn the other cheek thing that, you know, it doesn't make any sense to anybody who doesn't have God in their life. In England, there's a comic strip called Andy Cap. I've not really seen it myself, but I was reading about it this week. Andy Cap's a, a guy uh, who's a little nuts. He, he, he's a free-spirited guy. He feels like he's going to do whatever he's going to do, whatever he wants to do it. And this comic strip kind of outlines his, his dumb moves every, every time he does something. But he's married to this woman named Flo. And Flo's had it with Andy. I mean, Andy's crossed the line and, and she actually kicks him out of the house. So, but, you know, she, she has God's kind of love in her heart. She reconciles what she did, no matter what kind of character her husband is and what kind of dumb things he does. Uh, she brings him back in. She allows him to come home again. They go to church on some Sunday. And after the church service, the pastor comes up to Flo and says, you know, I'm sure glad you let Andy come home again. And she says, you know, there's something about me. She says, I, I, just, I just have to forgive and forget. You've heard that before, right? Forgive and forget. That's prompted by God's kind of love that motivates in our life. But Andy, Andy says to the pastor that afternoon, he says, you know, there's something else about her, though, that uh, she doesn't uh, ever seem to forget that she forgets. A little play in the words there. And we got to remember that as well, as, as Andy Cap's wife, Flo, does. We, 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 have, we can't forget that we have to forget. That's the essence of, of God's kind of love in our life today, is don't forget to forgive. And you might get tired of that. And you might think it's not fair sometimes with that individual so many times. Hurts my feelings or says things that just derail my, my happy life, if you will. What's the scripture talks? What does Jesus talk about? Seven times 70 is just the beginning of the times you got. That's the essence of God's kind of love in our hearts that we've got to try to deal with. That's the difference. It makes relationships holes again. It, 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 it uh, allows us uh, to uh, give up the right, you know, for revenge or to keep the scorecard or whatever it is that's going to perpetuate, you know, this, this, this animosity that we seem to have. And, and again, uh, within our little group, within our families, if you will, I think it's utmost for us to be able to have God's kind of love Arms that could be able to just make an impact on somebody who watches us and how we handle a situation. Do we get upset with one another? Oh man, don't we? You know, that's the natural. That's exactly right. That's the natural feelings that we're born with. And and we know that God does that, you know, just so we can implement his kind of love in our life. You know, in, in the, the, the show of the fact that you know what, that I am converted to his way. And no matter how much you can do to make me upset or whatever, I'm going to have this love that God puts in my heart, which is undefinable. I don't know how it gets there. I don't know how I do this, but somehow, some way, and we've all been able to practice this because we have God's kind of love in our heart. Maybe sometime to time we just have that reminders again that, you know what, I've got to deep, dig deep in myself and, and, and look for that again to be able to perpetuate the type of world that that's, this, this needs to be. And, and, and it's, it's, it's that love that God puts in our heart. Charity here, verse four says, charity suffereth long and it's kind. It envy it's not, and charity vaunt, charity vaunt it's not itself up, it's not puffed up. You know, true love, you know, is, is not about me. True love is about everybody else. And, and that's what Paul's talking about in the situation. It doesn't kind of get vaunted up and, and it doesn't create a situation where it's a me versus you type of a thing. You know, sometimes like in Flo's situation with Andy Cap, you know, we can't forget to forgive. You know, we cannot do that of our own volition though. That we got to believe 
in the best in people. And as we think about the best in people, they're going to think of us as a friend. And if they can think of us as a friend, you know, it's going to have an opportunity to show God working in our life. You know, that, that God is working in my life in spite of some very difficult situations that just consumes me sometimes from the natural person that I am. And, and we can't go through life being the natural people that we are. We've got to make that change. We've got to be different in our life. God's kind of love changes people. You know, now it changes uh, irritable people into gracious people. God's kind of love turns sour people into sweet people. Not for me to know how that happens, but it does. And it happens as you and I as individuals can continue to push forward in this world with the God's kind of love that we share with everybody else. It not only changes everything around you, it changes us. It kind of keeps us further grounded in that concept of who God is, as we talked about today. You know, uh, who is God? Well, God's uh, uh, doing a wonderful work in each and every one of us because we put him in the forefront of who we are and what we do. You know, uh, our, our biggest challenges in life is, is uh, uh, just remembering that. And, and Jesus told us one thing in very simple words of how to remember that. He, he said in, in John, it says, uh, I am the vine and you are the branches. He, said. he that abideth in me and I in him, says the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So remember that. As we venture out from our houses and the gym today and all that and go out to this world today, without him, in our life, we can do nothing. Well, without Jesus in our life, we cannot perpetuate God's kind of love in this world today. It just ain't going to happen. Paul says, going back to that scripture, Jesus says that if, if, if we don't abide in him in the vine, we're not going to bring forth much fruit. And he says that we can do nothing. But Paul says that if I... Uh, Speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity. I become a sounding brass and a tinkling sun. He goes on to say that if I have the gift of prophecy and mystery and have all faith to move mountains, if I don't have love, he says, I am nothing. He goes on to say, even though I bestow all my goods and feed the poor and give my body to be burned and don't have love, it profits me nothing. From two different perspectives, from Jesus himself that if we don't profess God's kind of love in our life, and from what Paul says in his observations here, if, if we don't have love in our life, we profit nothing, we are nothing, and all of our effort is for nothing. God's kind of love perpetuates what this world needs now today. Love, sweet love. It's the only thing that we need. Is that possible? Well, 4th Nephi tells us it is. You go to 4th Nephi, and it says here, And it came to pass there was no contention in the land, because of the love of God which dwell in the hearts of the people. And there were no envyings, and no strives, nor tumults, nor whoredoms, nor lying, nor murders, nor any manner of lasciviousness, and surely there could not have been a happier people among all the people who have been created by the hand of God. God's kind of love makes the difference. No other kind of love. Love that comes from our hearts because of what God puts in it. And so I hope, you know, that puts a little focus a little bit on and how just in a teeny little bit of way, we can make a difference in, in our family in our friends, in our neighbors, in that guy who's in the grocery store, who cuts in line, all these aggravating people that we have to live in this world with. God's kind of love will allow us to tolerate that and show a different life. Because if we can profess God's kind of love and not what we do in somebody's life today, 
change the world? I don't know. That's God's job to do that. But God says, you know what? You can make a difference in your world somehow. Just use my love, you know, to promote that. And just keep focused on that. God's kind of love. Let's uh, let's keep that as a as a reminder for us. Go to work out. Okay, John, it's your turn. Should we? There we go. I got off mute. <laughs> um, 